Well, good morning, everyone. For those of you who are uh, new or visiting, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the youth ministry director, and I also oversee the adult uh, grow and connect ministries. Our lead pastor, Todd Malone, he and his wife are on vacation in Oregon, and uh, they'll be out for a couple weeks, so I'll be filling in for him today and next week. Uh, but if you know you find you don't like it, Todd will be back soon. So, Well, today I'll be preaching the 14th message in our Unity in Action series. And again, for those of you who are new or visiting, this uh, series is... Uh, Basically, a walk through the book of Ephesians. That's why it's been so lengthy. And uh, we just have a few more messages to go in this. It is always, or I take that back, it's almost always a bad idea to start off a sermon by apologizing. Uh, One of the things they teach you when you're you're learning to preach is don't start by saying, man, I apologize for what I'm about to bring, and because that sets everybody's expectations low and then makes them think, well, why did I even bother to be here, you know, if that's all you've got for me. And so I'm not apologizing about the content that I'm about to deliver, but I do apologize in advance for my voice. I've had, uh, as you know, it, my voice isn't that great uh, on any given Sunday, but I've had a cold for the past few days, so it's, uh, it's a little bit rougher than usual. I have some peppermint tea here. We'll see how that helps. You know, that does taste terrible. <clears throat> well, well, uh, you guys heard the passage read. <clears throat> Excuse me. You guys heard the passage read, so you know that we are in one of the most controversial passages in the whole Bible. And the reason that it's controversial, well, there's a couple of reasons actually, but one of the reasons that it's controversial is because it's been misused. Sinful and selfish men have sometimes used this passage and others like it to assert dominance over the women in their lives or to justify uh, oppressing their wives or requiring their wives to basically cater to their every whim and want. <clears throat> and uh, let me just say, if you're a woman who has had that experience, if a man in your life or, or your husband uh, has domineered you, has, has uh, uh, attempted to assert dominance over you in every area of your life, if you've been mistreated or oppressed in any way, let me just say that God absolutely hates that. God hates the mistreatment of women. He hates the abuse of women. He hates people. uh, He he hates the use, uh, people using his word to justify their sinful and selfish actions. So uh, if that has been your experience, I just ask you to listen with new ears to this text and separate it from whatever experiences that you've had in the past that may have been negative because God never intended his word to be used to justify injustice or to justify sinfulness or selfishness. Now, another reason that this can be controversial is because uh, some of what it says is uncomfortable. And if you just are in that state this morning and you're like, man, I hear these verses and I really just don't like them, then I would just encourage you to turn your mind again to who gave us this word. This is from the Holy Spirit of God, the same God who uh, sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. This passage is just as inspired As John 3.16, so if it makes you uncomfortable or even angry, then you still need to receive it as it truly is, which is the word of God, and accept it as coming from the loving heart of an all-wise God. God did not give this scripture uh, with the intent of hurting us. He is giving that with the intent to uh, share his revelation to us and to help us to live under that revelation. All right, so there should be no more controversy. You can, uh, I'm going to give uh, out Jordan Johnson's email at the end of this so that y'all can, just kidding. He would take it anyway. He's, he's a great guy. Okay, so before we get into it, uh, let's reorient ourselves like we do every week to what Ephesians is about overall. This is a chart of the book of Ephesians. The first half of the book is primarily doctrinal. It talks about what God has done. And then the second half of the book turns to practical matters, meaning the practice of of our faith and what we are being told to do. And uh, again, I will just add that this, the very structure of this book communicates a basic truth that unless God acts, we cannot act for spiritual good. 
So until God intervenes in your life and makes you spiritually alive, which is what uh, the first half of the book talks about, then walking in the spirit is completely impossible and alien to you because you, you would be doing it in your own strength. We are going to be in the section that's highlighted there, Build Unified Marriages. The, uh, the passage today is actually the first half of what's often called a household code because uh, this these verses, as well as the verses we're going to look at next week, cover all the members of a household, and Paul is giving instructions to all of them how to live under Christ in a household. We're about to study what God has to say about the duties of husbands and wives. Uh, if you would like to know my qualifications, I have been married for 20 years, so that means I know nothing about this. The, uh, I will add this, and, and this is true uh, regardless of, of any topic of Scripture, but, but my, uh, what I say only carries authority insofar as, as it's consistent with the Word of God. So, as always, be listening to the text, seeing if what I say lines up with the text, and then you can receive it, of course, as authoritative. And if you're single, don't tune out, please. I realize that the focus of this message and this passage is on marriage, but... If you're single, most likely at some point in your life you'll be married. And even if you're not, you will definitely have friends or family that are married. And by knowing what God, uh, how God describes a Christ-like marriage, you'll be able to encourage, support, and possibly even counsel friends at some point in the future. And speaking of marriages, I found this great advice that uh, the great philosopher Socrates gave to men. He said, by all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> I assume he was <laughs> commenting on his own marriage at, uh, when he said that. Is that. Interestingly, I'm sure you noticed this as Taylor was reciting this. Today's passage actually tells two stories. It's talking in, in, in one track about the story of a husband and a wife and how they live together in unity when both are united uh, to Christ. And then we woven throughout that, almost said weaved, <laughs> woven throughout that is the story of Christ and his love for the church. One of these stories is one that will last for a lifetime. That, of course, is the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And the other story is a love story that will last forever, the relationship of Christ to the church. My prayer is that this morning I'm able, by the help of God's Spirit, to just clearly explain what it is the text is saying, and that your hearts and minds will be enriched by that. I, uh, to explain this passage, I break it into three components, the command to wives, the command to husbands, and then the relationship of Christ and the church. So uh, let's go ahead and look at those in turn. First of all, the command to wives, submit to your husband. Now, the previous section, and, and Todd referred to this as he was ending his sermon last week, if you'll recall, but the previous section ends with this phrase, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul is saying that all of us have a duty to yield ourselves to others, to serve one another, to act with a servant's heart toward one another, regardless of your position. Uh, so, for instance, the elders in our church are an authority over me, but they also have an obligation by God and under God's Spirit to be servants to us, us in the church, even though we are under their authority. So God is saying, as, a, as sort of an overarching message, all of you should be approaching one another with a servant's heart, with a desire to meet others' needs, with a desire to put their needs ahead of yours. <clears throat> so keep that in mind as kind of the background of what he's about to say. Verse 22, well, let, let me just read these again. Uh, verses 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to in, in Excuse me. So also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And then at the end of the paragraph, I put verse 33 with this one because he gives a summary statement of what he had just said. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
Now, before I get into the meaning of these verses, I want to point out something that's really interesting. Uh, one of the commentaries I consulted pointed this out, and I thought it was very powerful. Twice in this verse, the English translations had to add the verb into the sentence in order to make it read naturally. So look at it again with, with, these, uh, with a more direct translation. You'll see in verses 22 and 24 that doesn't say submit. There's a black hole there. It says, it would say this more naturally, excuse me, more literally, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives in everything to their husbands. Now the translators were correct in putting the word submit in both of those places because verse 22 is referring back to verse 21, which ended with submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it is clearly implying that submit is what is being uh, commanded of the wives. And then verse 24, the second half of the verse, is referring back to the first half, which says the church submits. And then he's saying, so also the wife submits. So it was correct to, to supply those words, but here's the reason that, that I even bring that up. It seems as though Paul is trying to soften the command as he gives it to wives. In other words, hand it to them more gently. Instead of just directly saying, wives submit, he says, well, the church submits, and so you must also. It's just a more gentle way of handing over that command to wives. And I think it's uh, instructive that Paul recognized, especially in the first century, that women in general were regarded as second-class citizens. They fewer rights and obviously much less power than men. And so when he's telling them that their, their duty is to submit, he wanted to, to gently hand that to them, recognizing, of course, the abuses that were going on back then. <clears throat> okay, so let's put the verbs back in so that it reads more naturally and look at what the Spirit is saying to wives. Wives are commanded to submit to their husbands and to respect their husbands. To submit means to yield. It means to subordinate or put yourself under an authority. And just so there's no misunderstanding, I do want to emphasize that this passage is not saying that men are better than women. It is not saying that men are smarter than women. Uh, we all know that's not true. <clears throat> Excuse me. God's order for the family is not a statement of value. In the next section, God is going to say, children, obey your parents. And God does not regard children as less valuable as humans than parents. So God is not saying wives are less valuable than or less important than husbands. He is simply setting up an order by which the family should be, uh, by which the family should operate. Verse 33 says, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now this is really interesting because the word that's translated respects could also be translated fears. But the reason uh, modern translations especially, in fact, I'm, uh, the King James doesn't say fears either for that matter. Uh, the reason that we shy away from using that word is because of the, the connotations it would have in our society. Because we're, we don't want a wife to fear her husband in regards to, I fear for being harmed, or I fear what he will do to me. What it is talking about, and that's why it was, it was translated this way, it is talking about a deep reverence or, or a high respect. In fact, in verse 21, when it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, that's the same word that's translated as reverence. So another way to say it is that a wife should revere or have high or deep respect for her husband. And again, it's not because your husband is better than you. It's simply because of the role that God has given him. You should respect him because of that role. It's, it's an attitude that puts a wife's heart in a posture of submission. God is giving us the order of the family where husbands and wives have different roles. <clears throat> he isn't saying that women are inferior. He isn't saying that women are less capable of making wise and godly decisions. So what does it mean for a wife to submit to and revere her husband? Well, before I get to that, I do want to look just briefly at the how and why of submission. There are three phrases that are used to describe how a wife submits to her husband. Excuse me, how a wife submits. Uh, it's, he said, as, uh, to your own husband, as to the Lord, in everything. And the first one is really more important than you might think. A wife is to submit to her own husband. That means that, wives, you are not commanded by God to submit to every man in society. You are to submit to your own husband. <clears throat> and I, the reason I bring that up, believe it or not, 
and maybe some of you have experienced this, but within conservative evangelical Christian circles, there have been people that have said that a woman should submit to any man in her life. So basically, all the men in society are above all the women in society. And that is not what Paul just said. He said, submit to your own husband. <clears throat> you don't have to submit to another uh, man just because he is a man. And that also means that a wife, uh, excuse me, that a woman is not commanded to submit to her boyfriend or, or fiancé. So a, a boyfriend or fiancé should be initiating and taking leadership in a relationship, but a woman is not required by God to submit to a boyfriend or fiancé. That doesn't happen until that man's status changes to husband. Until then, he does not have, <clears throat> excuse me, he does not have authority over you. So don't let your boyfriend use this passage in that way. Secondly, the wife submits as to the Lord, and that helps to frame the shape of a wife's submission as to the Lord. You submit to your, to your husband in the same way that you submit to Christ. Your submission to your husband is an act of submission to Christ. You don't submit to your husband in anything sinful. You don't submit to your husband if he's dishonoring God. And one thing that I think that means that's very important is that a wife has no obligation. In fact, I would say she should not submit to a husband who is abusing her because she would then be enabling him to continue in his sin. A wife who is being abused has every right and should immediately flee that situation. She has no, no call, uh, excuse me, no obligation to submit to a man that's abusing her. And then finally... He says that a wife should submit in everything. Holy mackerel. That sounds pretty far-reaching, doesn't it? So is he saying that a wife really has no say in her marriage and family? Is she supposed to depend on her husband to make every single decision in her life? Well, no. No, of course not. Uh, well, although I say of course not, last night I ran across this article that was talking about this very issue and, and what are the, the limits or the extents of a wife's submission when it says in everything. And again, there are guys, actually men and women, who have written books, solid Bible-believing Christian people that would say, yes, that means every single decision in a, woman, in a wife's life should be under subjection to her husband. And one of the examples that I read that I, still staggers me when I think about it, so the, the, uh, there was a wife and a husband, and they, this is back before there were seatbelt laws. But the wife wanted her children to, be, to wear their seatbelts when we were in the car, and the husband didn't think it was any big deal. So uh, the woman decides, okay, I've got to submit it to him in this so we won't buckle the kids. And uh, one time, the husband had to hit the brakes very hard, and so one of the kids comes flying from the back seat to the front seat. He was unharmed, but I'm sure he was terrified. And the author of this book said, since the child was unharmed, it showed that her submission was God-honoring in this example. Now, yeah, I see y'all all groaning rightfully. Isn't that absolutely ridiculous? I think instead, like my wife said, that was showing that God was being merciful that that child didn't get hurt for this husband's foolish, uh, fo foolishness. So no, a wife does not have to submit in every single area of her life. When he says in everything, he is talking about every area over which the husband has authority as the head of the home. In everything means that a wife submits to her husband in the areas related to the life of the marriage. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it, is, uh, it would be sinful for a husband to try to dictate to his wife, as well as physically dangerous, to try to dictate to his wife how she uh, styles her hair or what she wears or what she eats. Or, and I have even heard that this, and again, I'm, I'm ashamed that this is in this tradition I'm a part of, uh, American Evangelical Christianity. But there were people writing and saying, the husband needs to be able to approve every single friend that the wife has. And he needs to be able to approve every mu piece of music she listens to and every book she reads. And I'm thinking, oh my word. Now I see why people, for instance, on the left of Christianity are going, oh, what, you guys are absolutely nuts over there. Because sometimes, that's, we are nuts sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat> so when the God says that a wife should submit in everything, he's talking about everything over which the husband has authority, which, is, which would be basically like the direction of the family, things, things directly affecting the marriage. <clears throat> now, uh, why, 
Why should the wife submit? He gives a reason for that too, because the husband is the head of the wife. Not because men are better, not because men are more responsible, but again, God is establishing an order by which the family can operate in unity, and that requires a single head or a single authority, and God has given that role to the husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. My wife, Jamie, is far more intelligent than I am, but I am given the role as the head of our home, not because I'm more qualified for it, but because that is the role that God has assigned to me. So wives, you may have husbands that are dull-witted or immature, and you may think, don't point, please don't point, uh, don't. <laughs> you may think that they're therefore not qualified to be the head of the home, but it is not based upon intellect or maturity, it is simply the role that God has given to the husband in a family. Now it does underscore the importance of choosing a husband. It underscores the importance of finding a man who is spiritually mature, that you would be willing and disposed to submit to, and not some dull-witted, immature person. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going off script. I apologize. Let me, rolling up my sleeves, it's getting me distracted. So think about it this way. Your submission is based upon your husband's position. Your submission is an act of submitting to the Lord. Okay, so what does it mean to submit. It means that you are willing to yield to your husband's leadership. You're willing to let your husband lead you. You're willing to let him decide, <clears throat> ultimately decide, the direction of the family. I ran across uh, some great information. By the way, you may have noticed this, but I'm doing a lot of quotes in this uh, passage because I feel so unqualified to talk about it. <clears throat> One of my... Uh, spiritual mentors from afar is a, a longtime pastor in Minnesota named John Piper. And he has written extensively on manhood and womanhood and marriage and that kind of thing. And I actually have some very significant disagreements with a lot of the things he has said on that as well as other areas. However, I ran across an article he had written, or maybe it was from a sermon he did from this very passage, and he has an extremely well-worded and insightful, uh, some extremely well-worded and insightful comments. Listen to this. He says this, when Paul says, wives submit to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, he means that a wife should be disposed to yield to her husband's authority and should be inclined to follow his leadership. And he continues, I refer to an inclination to yield and a disposition to follow because no subjection to another human is absolute. The husband does not replace Christ as the woman's supreme authority. But I really like the way he put that. And uh, how did he put it? <laughs> Submit, submitting to your husband means that you have an inclination to yield and a disposition to follow. So there is not an absolute straight line from uh, your husband to you as if he is in place of Christ. He is not. Christ is still, of course, uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords over all. <clears throat> but you have an inclination or a disposition that says, okay, I want to follow you. I want to allow you to lead. So that's the command to wives, submit to your husbands. Now we'll look at the other side of the equation, the command to husbands, love your wives. Look at the verbs that he uses to describe the husband's role in marriage. Love, nourish, cherish, hold fast. This is what it means to be the head of a home. This is what it means to exercise headship as a husband. You exercise it by loving your wife. Love is the giving of yourself for the good of another. So husbands are to give of themselves for the good of their wives. And I think it is very instructive that Paul says the primary duty of a husband is not to make sure his wife submits. Because that's the impression we get sometimes. You read that first part, a wife submit to your husband's. So then the husband needs to make sure his wife submits. That is not what Paul says is the main duty of a husband. He says the main duty is to love your wife. The primary duty is to love her sacrificially. It's not to make sure that his wife is yielding to his leadership. It's not to make sure that his wife is acting under his authority. It's to make sure that he is loving her. And Paul modifies this command with three phrases to help husbands understand what they're being told. The first and most important phrase is this, as Christ loved the church. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
Just as he did with his instruction to wives, Paul ties this command to Jesus. A husband should love his wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He said it, didn't he? He gave himself up for her. Jesus Christ gave his life for the church. That means that husbands should love wives sacrificially. If you ever wonder if you love your wife enough, ask yourself if you love her as much as Christ loves the church. The answer will always be no. Jesus gave his life for the church so husbands should love their wives sacrificially. We should love our wives in ways that require us to die to ourselves. That means that we sacrifice our comfort for our wives. We sacrifice our safety for our wives. We sacrifice our wants. We sacrifice our ambition for the good of our wives. Suppose you're climbing up the corporate ladder and you get the opportunity to take a vice president's position. The upside is that it's a higher position and the pay is significantly more. But the downside is you'll have to spend one week a month out of town and you're expected to work 80 or more hours a week. Now, it may be good and right and wise and godly for you to take that position. But the primary uh, factor that you should be looking at is not what it does for your career or banking account, but how loving it is toward your wife. And you can see just by Paul saying that, that we're, the primary duty of the husband is to love his wife, that that automatically means that husbands are not unilaterally making decisions and running the home. Because the only way you're going to know if this is a loving action toward your wife is to discuss it with her. So you can see why all decisions in the household are still going to be a mutual thing. So you're going to discuss it with your wife because you need to know, is this loving toward her? You can no longer make a decision just thinking about yourself. Your primary duty is now to love your wife. Just as Jesus gave up his life for the church, husbands need to be willing to give up their lives for their wives. It's a lofty standard that's impossible to meet, but in Christ, it's what all husbands should be aiming for. Paul adds two more phrases to describe how a husband should love his wife as their own bodies and as himself. Loving our wives as Christ loves the church gives us a broad sweeping picture of life, but when you start thinking about the nitty gritty details of daily living, it may be difficult to put that into practice. So he says, well, think about it this way. Love your wife in the same way that you love yourself. Like verse 29 points out, we naturally nourish and cherish our own flesh, our own bodies. We look out for what is best for our own bodies. We meet the needs of our own bodies. We take the time to care for our own bodies. That's how you love your wife. You meet her needs. You care for her. You invest in her. You cherish her. And the reason the husband should love his wife is the same reason that the wife should submit to the husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Your position as head gives you the responsibility to care for, to love, to nurture, and to protect your wife. <clears throat> In Matthew 20, 25 through 28, Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you as a husband are lording your authority over your wife, then you are being ungodly. You are not loving her. You are not, respond, you're, excuse me, you're not representing Christ. If your focus is on exercising your authority, you're being ungodly. You're not representing Christ. Because Christ just said, yes, that is how the pagans do it. They want to make sure everybody knows that they're in charge. But that is not how you do it in Christ. You serve. You love. To be the head of the, your wife means that you serve her. Canadian pastor Tim Challey says this, a husband's leadership is not first a matter of breaking ties or solving impasses, but a matter of being the first to love, the first to serve, the first to repent, the first to forgive. The call to lead is the call to display Christ-like humility and Christ-like love. And in addition to being the head of the wife, Paul gives one more reason to love your wife. Verse 31 says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Two people who are joined in marriage are united to each other. They're considered one flesh, a unit, no longer just two people who may live in the same house. Your lives and your futures are now bound together. 
<clears throat> okay, those are the commands to the spouses to submit and to love. Lord willing, you have a little better understanding of both of those. And now just uh, briefly, I want to look at the relationship between Christ and the church. Have you guys ever known a married couple that was just about perfect? They just adored one another. The husband was constantly singing his wife's praises and serving her and caring for her and showing her affection. The wife held the husband in great and high esteem. She respected him. She loved him. She cared for him. They just absolutely delighted to be with each other. It looked like they probably never had a disagreement. They just looked like the perfect couple. Have you ever known somebody like that? No? Maybe a few, a few of you, maybe. Well, the relationship between Christ and the church is not like that. <clears throat> the relationship between Christ and the church is more like a couple where the husband is faithful and loving and kind and generous and the wife is ungrateful, demanding, and fickle because that's us, the church. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Christ is perfectly and righteously loving us, but we are not perfectly submitting to him. But Jesus is patient with us and continues to love us in spite of our sins. So let's look for a few minutes at Jesus and his relationship to the church. Verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Jesus is the head of the church. He's the one who created the church. He's the absolute authority over the church. And in contrast, every man that's ever existed apart from Jesus, he's a perfect head. He isn't cruel. He isn't selfish. He isn't domineering. He's the church's savior. He rescued us from slavery to sin. He rescued us from the righteous wrath of God. He rescued us from condemnation and judgment. Jesus is the head of the church, our Lord, our King, our righteous ruler. And our response to his headship is submission. <clears throat> Verse 24 says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives. Unlike the wife's submission to an earthly husband, our submission to Christ should be total. Our submission to him should be complete. He's the king over all of our lives, every area our thoughts, our affections, our words, our actions. Because he saved us, because he gave us life, because he is our head, we should submit to him. We should yield our whole being to him. We sang earlier, I surrender all. That is the posture that we need to have. And I recognize we don't do that well, and I hope you recognize that as well. That's why I compared us to the fickle wife. But that's the posture we should fight for. We should strive for. We should aim to please God. We should aim to submit to Christ. Now look at all the things that Jesus does for us as our righteous and perfect head. Starting in the second half of verse 25, it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And then verses 29 and 30 uh, add that Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church as members of his own body. <clears throat> Jesus gave himself up for us. He gave his life to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and brought into his family, united to him forever. First Peter 1 says, you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. He died in order for the church to exist. And in addition to dying for us, the Bible says he sanctifies us. It says he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify the church, make the church holy and clean. He does that by the washing of water with the word, the word of the gospel that Jesus is Lord and he has died for your sins and risen from the dead, cleanses us when we respond in faith because our sins are washed away and we are now given the righteous robes of Christ to wear. He cleanses the church in order to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing. That points to the end of the age when the church now perfected is presented to the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 21. <clears throat> you may have heard sermons that use this uh, verse to, to exhort believers to live righteously. Jesus is coming back for a bride that is spotless and without wrinkle. Have any of you ever, ever heard those kind of sermons? <laughs> If that was just me. I'm sorry. I'm going to move ahead anyways if you have. 
Sometimes we use a verse like that in order to say, this is why you need to live a righteous life. This is why you need to be obeying God because Jesus is coming for a bride that is spotless and without wrinkle and without blemish. But if you think about that for a minute, you realize that can't be true. Because how many of you are willing to stand up and say, okay, Jesus, you can take me now. I am spotless and I am unblemished and I am completely clean and holy. No man stands before God and can say that. <clears throat> it said that Jesus sanctifies the church. Jesus washes us to make, so that he can present us to himself holy and without blemish and spotless and without wrinkle. <clears throat> the righteousness of Christ is credited to us and that is why he can treat us as a perfectly spotless bride. Indeed, we should be striving to aim for the righteousness of God. We should be striving to live in ways that please him. We should be aiming for holiness in our life. But that is not dependent, excuse me, but uh, the church being spotless is not dependent upon how well you're living. Because if it were, then he's not going to find a bride that's spotless and without wrinkle. It's going to be spotless because he's going to make it that way. And Jesus nourishes and cherishes us in addition to cleansing us. Your husband or wife may not cherish you as they should, but if you're a believer, Jesus cherishes you. He delights in you. He sings over you. He rejoices in you as you are right now. Immature, dim-witted, selfish, sinful. He's already delighting in you. He's already enjoying you. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's one of the ways that Jesus cherishes you. He prays for you. Every single person who is a follower of Christ, Jesus prays for you constantly. Jesus loved the church. He gave himself for the church. He sanctifies and nourishes the church and cherishes it. Last thing that's mentioned in these verses about the relationship between Christ and the church is that marriage is a picture of that relationship. Verses 32, excuse me, 31 and 32 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's a quote from Genesis 2, 24. And then he adds, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. A mystery, as you'll recall from uh, earlier in the book of Ephesians, a mystery is a truth that was hidden in ages past that has now been revealed. And so this, the truth that is being revealed is that the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife is a picture, is an illustration of the relationship between Christ and the church, his people. So way back at the beginning of humanity, when God first created this thing called marriage, he was making something to picture the beautiful relationship between the son and the people of God. There is cost, leaving father and mother. There is covenant love, hold fast to your wife. There's unity, the two shall become one flesh. When you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit baptizes you, immerses you into the body of Christ, and you are then united to Jesus, one flesh with him. A Christian marriage in which the husband is loving his wife and is submitting to her husband is a picture of that loving unity. So here's the point of the passage. Wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should love their wives because Christ loves the church and the church submits to Christ. Now, I realize that is a very long point. So I also have a shorter point. Your marriage illustrates Christ's unity with the church. One of the meanings of illustrate is to make something clear by using picture. And the, the marriage between two believers is a picture to the world of the relationship Jesus has with his people. You should aim to make that picture as accurate as possible. It won't be a perfect picture, but it can still be an accurate picture. Wives, make it your goal to have an inclination to yield to your husband, to respect him. Husbands, make it your goal to love your wife, to put her needs above your needs, to sacrifice for her. Yes, you will fail and I will fail. But because Jesus never failed, you and I can be forgiven for not yielding and not loving. And because Jesus never failed, you and I can be enabled by the Holy Spirit to submit, however imperfectly, and to love, however imperfectly. I'll end this part of the message with uh, words from Pastor Kim Riddlebarger. He said this, because Jesus already loves us, 
Because Jesus has already given himself up for us, for all the times we did not submit nor love as we ought. Because Jesus is even now sanctifying us, because Jesus has already cleansed us, and because Jesus will present us to his Father, who in turn gives the church to Jesus as his bride, this is why wives are to imitate their Lord in submitting to their husbands, and why husbands are to imitate their Lord in loving their wives as themselves. <clears throat> Let me uh, close with a few responses to this message. Uh, first of all, as we say every week, a good thing to do is to rewrite this passage in your own words. It helps you to think through what it's really saying and to uh, bury that truth more deeply in your heart. And then if you're married, ask your spouse how you can submit to or love them better. Uh, one of the things I recognized last well, earlier this week, was that uh, whenever I come up with these responses, I'm very poor about following through and doing them myself. So uh, yesterday afternoon, I asked my wife, how can I better love you? And uh, we had a two-hour discussion after that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, so if you're married, ask your spouse, how can I submit to you better for the wife? How can I love you better for the husband? If you're single... Tell someone about an area where you've grown in submission to the Lord. There's something you've discovered in your walk with the Lord, how you've been able to submit to him about a, a sin that you had to fight against or a habit that you had to give up, something like that. Third, we can praise the Lord. For, it's not third, is it? It's probably like fourth. I don't know. Okay. Fourth, we can praise the Lord for loving us and ask for his help to submit to him because, of course, he is our head, and therefore it is our responsibility to submit to him, and we know that he is constantly loving us. Next, I've got another two-parter. If you're married, choose one thing to do this week to show submission to your husband or love to your wife. And it can flow, of course, from the conversation that you have where you ask, what is something I can do that would show you submission or love? <clears throat> if you're single, choose one thing that, to do this week to show submission to Jesus. It may be a habit that you have to fight against. It may be something that you need to give up that you've been holding on to. Once I close in prayer, there is going to be people up here across the stage that are willing to pray with you. If you don't know the Lord, if you're struggling with something, if you have any kind of burden that you would like support or encouragement for, we would all be happy. Uh, anyone that's up here would be happy to, uh, to pray with you. So uh, let's go to the Lord and uh, praise him for what he has shown us. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I want to thank you for what you have revealed. I, as a husband, Lord, I, I shouldn't be sitting here thinking, okay, where, where is my wife not submitting? I should be thinking, Lord, where am I not loving my wife? Where am I misrepresenting Christ to her? Give me the strength to change that. Show me my blind spots, God, and grant me repentance to run from those and to run toward you. God, thank you for this word that you have given, the, the beautiful picture of a Christian husband and a Christian wife loving each other unreservedly. And thank you for the even greater picture of your son loving us, the people of God, forever, dying for us, cleansing us, nourishing, cherishing, caring for us. Lord, I pray that every believer in this room would be encouraged in the love that you have shown them. I pray that they would be able to rest knowing that their lives may not be spotless and without wrinkle, but in you, they are spotless and without wrinkle because they have the righteousness of Christ. And Lord, I pray that if there are any unbelievers in here this morning, people that don't know you, I pray that you would convince them that they are separated from you and that they need your righteousness, but you are standing here with your arms wide open, ready to receive them, to forgive, to restore, and bring them into your family. Lord God, I pray for a special measure of grace on everyone who is here this morning. In your holy name, amen. You are dismissed. May God bless you this week.